right, good evening everyone and thank you for joining us for tonight's event, Storing the Future, First Nations and Education in Decolonising Australia. Look, I'd like to start by acknowledging traditional owners and down here it's uh, the Bunurong people or the Bunurong people, uh, people of the Kulin Nations and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present and obviously extend that um, acknowledgement to my Aboriginal colleagues here tonight. Um, <clears throat> my name is Jamil Time, a proud Yorta Yorta man, but I actually do have connections uh, to the Bunurong people. My Great, great, great grandmother was a woman by the name of Louisa Esme Briggs, who was, her mother was taken from Point Nepean by, um, by sealers, and um, I think taken to Flinders Island and then um, <clears throat> born there, but she did make her way back to Bunurang country, and we're thankful that she did because she's passed on a lot of the, the stories and I guess <clears throat> the knowledges and connections that we still we know about today. So, um, you know, down Point Nepean, there's some really, I guess, um, landscape down there that's been untouched by colonisation, and so we're really lucky that that's still a resource that we're able to go and visit and um, feel connected to her through there. But um, I'll start by saying Tay Bundal Ganak, Ngatha Jamil, Wanam, Wanam, Yakamanja, Kamraganja, Nathalia Yoru Yoru Waka, which is um, hello, welcome, my name's Jamil, and uh, my family are from Kamraganja. Um, Tonight we've got a bit of a hybrid event, so obviously there's a people in the in the room, but there's a lot of people that are joining us online. I mean, I must admit it's nice to see everyone in person again. It's been a, a rough couple of years, as we know, but um, it also makes it less intimidating to uh, present to a smaller group. So that, that's a good thing for us all. Um, <clears throat> but we will be encouraging, uh, you know, we want this to be a really interactive session with our speakers. So, um, you know. I think the first hour or so will be me asking a few questions of our panellists and then there'll be an opportunity for the, for the audience here to ask questions. So when you do that, just put your hand up and you know, I think there'll be a microphone that comes around and we'll be able to, to get to you there. But if you're joining us online, um, you can ask questions through the YouTube uh, comments and then it, they'll appear up on the Slido. So you'll be, you'll be able to actually vote on that. And I do know that we've got our first Slido uh, poll up there. So this, this one's a pretty simple one. It's where you're joining us from, just to make sure it's working, I guess. But scan that if you're in the audience and uh, feel free to contribute to the discussion. Um, <clears throat> also, I'd like you to encourage you all to, to tweet as well. So tweet throughout the session and use the ha hashtag, uh, hashtags, research in action, um, hashtag First Nations or hash, hash Hashtag decolonising Australia and tag at Monash Education. So I'd like to uh, introduce tonight's topic, and you probably have seen this through the event description, but it's um, the focus will be we create the future through the stories we tell about who we are, who we want to be, and the place we want in a world that is also changing. Our esteemed panel of scholars and education leaders will challenge us to think about the stories we need to tell about Indigenous knowledges, languages, and cultures in creating the future of Australia. Starting from the premise that education systems have an extraordinarily powerful impact on what stories are even possible to tell, we'll hear ex inclusive narratives built out of truth, reconciliation and learning. This panel discussion will reimagine how First Nations people can help us shape a different and more powerful <coughs> sense of who we are and who we can be that live on these lands and of the nation going through a long process of decolonisation. So I'd like to introduce our panellists uh, to tonight as well. And so, um, they're all uh, esteemed and recognised in their field as, as leaders. So if I was to go through all of their achievements, we'd probably take up the two hours, but I'll keep it, keep it short. So first we've got um, Auntie Tracy, uh, Professor Tracy Bunder. So Tracy uh, Bunder is a, and um, correct me if I say this wrong, Aunt Nugi, Waka Waka woman and professor and academic director of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies Unit at the University of Queensland. So Tracy has over three decades experience in leadership within the university. Her research interests include race and power, indigenous women's leadership and indigenous education. Her expertise is sought by universities, government and industry. Additionally, Tracy practices bush food gar uh, gardening and weaving. Uh, we, we next have Associate Professor Nikki Moody. So Nikki is a queer Gamilaroi woman and the Program director, director and Deputy Director of uh, the Atlantic Fellows for Social Equity at the University of Melbourne. Uh, following an early career in the public service, she completed a PhD in Indigenous Adult Education and Social Networks and moved into the university sector. She has held appointments in Sociology, Education and Chancellery at the University of Melbourne, where she has led a range of initiatives in Indigenous higher education and curriculum design. Holding a BA in Political Science from the University of Queensland and a PhD in Sociology from the Australian uh, National University, 
Her research interests include social capital, Indigenous success and governance. So, uh, we also have Mr Zach Haddock, my Yorta Yorta brother. Um, Zach is the Executive Director of the Koori Outcomes Division at the Victorian Department of Education and Training. Um, so Zach has extensive public sector leadership and management experience gained in both Victorian government and non-government organisations. Over the last 19 years, Zach has supported the Victorian education system to better support outcomes for Koori children within the school, early childhood and higher education sectors. Zach has filled the roles of Koori educator, Koori home uh, school liaison officer, Koori engagement support officer, Koori education coordinator and Koori education manager and is the incumbent, uh, well I can announce tonight, you're not, you're not only the incumbent, you're now the ongoing executive director of the Koori outcome uh, division. Zach is passionate about supporting educational outcomes of Koori communities and Zach holds the following quali uh, qualifications, a Bachelor of Nursing, Bachelor of uh, education in primary schooling, uh, graduate cert uh, in public sector leadership and a master's in business administration. And finally we've got Mr Eddie Cabillo also from the University of Melbourne. So Eddie is an Aboriginal man uh, with strong family links in both the urban and rural areas throughout the Northern Territory. He's a uh, Larrakea, Wodjigan and Central Arenti man. He obtained a Bachelor of Law, uh, law degree and was an in was admitted to the Supreme Court of the Northern Territory. In 2002, he was elected to the Atsik Yili Riong Regional Council and subsequently became the chair. Mr. Cabillo has uh, has also been a former chair of both the <laughs> uh, of both the North Australian Aboriginal Justice Agency and the Aboriginal Justice Advisory Committee. In 2010, Mr. Cabillo was appointed the Anti-Discrimination Commissioner of the Northern Territory. Uh, so Mr Kabila then took on the role of Executive Officer with the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Legal Service. As the Executive Director, he championed the rights of Indigenous Australians in the legal context. Um, in 2015, he was named the National Indigenous Legal Professional of the Year and in 2016, attended Geneva on a UN Indigenous Fellowship. In 2017, he then took up an opportunity to work with the Royal Commission into the protection and detention of Aboriginal children in the Northern Territory as a Director of Community Engagement. He's currently undertaking a PhD with the University of Technology of Sydney and is working part-time at the University of Melbourne's Law School as a senior fellow. So would you all please join me in uh, welcoming our guests for tonight? <laughs> so I feel very lucky to be able to facilitate discussion and thank uh, Viv for asking me to be a part of it. Um, the, I guess from here, I'm going to ask, like I mentioned before, I'll ask a series of questions and then after about an hour or so, we'll throw it open to the, uh, to the audience and make it a bit more interactive. So I'll take a seat and I will start with the, the first question and I'll start with, uh, start with you, Arne. Um, so what stories do we need to tell about Indigenous peoples in the future of Australia? Um, before I do that, can I just, I want to say two things. Um, is everybody happy if I do um, the collective sort of acknowledgement of the country that, okay, and then that will save everybody for doing it, all right. So we too <coughs> would like to acknowledge um, the lands on which we are speaking tonight and pay our respects to um, the elders of this country, but also acknowledge that it wasn't only the elders but members of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community who have struggled through to be able to make contribution local levels as well as um, global levels. Then the second thing I want to say is that um, Eddie's not a mister, Eddie is actually a doctor. Yes. <laughs> Sorry Eddie. And um, would have been conferred earlier this year and then graduated recently. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, just want to make that distinction. Um, I think thinking about the future, you know, um, allows possibility. So let me start here. I just want to answer it with um, two responses. The first of all, after a three-year term, Prime Minister Linda Burney has been able to provide enormous social and cultural uplift for 
the nation and has transformed, has made the space that has transformed the way in which Indigenous people are considered as um, integral citizenry of the nation. So that's the first thing. The second thing, because I know I'm talking to an education audience, is that our kids left the non-Indigenous schools. Non-Indigenous schools during this term were not meeting our children's needs. And so with that social and cultural uplift, our communities were able to establish schooling systems all across the nation and our children were able to be able to graduate um, with phenomenal, phenomenal academic acumen and cultural acumen um, to turn around um, those statistics that are currently measuring um, uh, success for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students based on very, very white systems. Um, and that, above all else, has given um, enormous, enormous strength for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community, knowing that the next generations um, have not only um, the expertise of the white nation, but also have um, accredited and practiced and um, informed uh, their own cultural knowledge system. Thank you, Art. Zach, yeah. Wow, what a what a very hard statement to follow. I probably, <laughs> I, I drew the short straw, Annie, on on where I was sitting today. Well, no, I, I think I think that story, if I can continue your one, um, it, it did begin before that term was served with uh, with a, a story of um, inclusiveness. It, it started with a story of recognition of um, organic intellectualism, which is which is what we um, bring from from our, our our life. It's what we bring from our experiences, and the recognition of that as a as a valued and valid part of of our collective society in Australia, and particularly in in Victoria. And that, that story um, comes not from a static otherness, which I, I think is a, is an, um, a, a, a historic assumption of Aboriginal Victoria that it's the otherness and it's, it's traditional, it's, it, it's over there, um, but from an, an, an understanding of uh, the, um, the contemporary evolution of human society in general and that we're obviously a part of that and, and, um, and we contribute to the continuing evolution of, of society. What was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> the question was, uh, what stories do we, do we need to tell about Indigenous peoples in the future of Australia? Oh, well, OK. Well, now I know why. <laughs> Look, I, I think for, for me that's a really kind of complicated question, right? Because it asked, for me, who is the person telling these particular stories? And I think for me it opens up the question of what stories do Indigenous people, what do we want to tell about ourselves? And what are the kinds of subjectivities that other people are experiencing when they're telling stories about us? Right? Which is a question about not necessarily decolonisation, I think, but resurgence. And this, I think, connects to what Aunt was saying, that, you know, the, the idea that Indigenous futures are defined by Indigenous peoples that are, you know, multiplex and rich and reassert, you know, rights that and knowledges that we've long held in new different and exciting ways you know, opens the question about what are the structures what are the what are the kinds of solidarities that we need to be able to get there and how then do non-indigenous people triangulate themselves to either stand in solidarity with those imagined futures um, and perhaps to see a path that is different to the one that we've been walking on together so far so yep um i just want to acknowledge um only Tracy here for telling anyone that I made my got a doctorship finally um, has been very helpful and um, also need to respect that those who came before us made it easy for us to do so 
um, in saying that I'm not a come from an education background like our three people here, so um, forgive me and you're using the great words of pedagogy and all this sort of stuff tonight, but so my background is in the legal space um, and I'm currently working at the um, Melbourne Law School, which is um, currently the number one law school in the country apparently and number five in the world. Um, and they did that whilst um, COVID was on and if you read something recently, um, this, the university made millions of dollars whilst that was on, So, um, which um, is very um, scary considering I'm running now the Indigenous Law and Justice Hub at the school and it's um, running very on a smell of an oily rag of sorts. So what I just wanted to say that um, the legal system and the law profession in this country is probably the last bastion of um, colonialism in this country, um, and, and, it's, and it's taught accordingly. Um, and one of my roles at the review that was done with the Melbourne Law School is to um, look at curriculum, um, and, and we've been doing that. We've um, r really um, embedded a lot of Indigenous um, content, particularly Indigenous um, writings in those spaces which um, we're, we're missing and, and um, it's continued to be missing and, and taught um, really lightly and, and, and the, the continued excuse in this space is that um, they're not Indigenous. Mm. But the reality is I'm in a law school of 120 plus academics and there's like two of us as academics so the reality in the country is um, we're three percent of the population so you're not going to get an indigenous person teaching everything so that that excuse doesn't wear with us in that in that discussion and um, also if we look across the country the council australian law deans have come out and and basically said that the curriculum's racist um, and that the, that the system itself is racist. Um, we've had Supreme Court judges also say the same. Um, so everyone knows that um, they've done a review on the um, legal curriculum in this country around the priestly 11s, you know, the main um, core units that you need to do to get your uh, law degree. And um, that review's on hold. Um, and, you know, my role at the University is now at the law school is trying to um, embed curriculum, and the reality is that the, we we um, there's a legal methods and research, which is a two-week course, which is um, really for first years to give them an understanding of um, what they're going to get for the next three years, and 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 we've really um, ramped that up with indigenous content, and um, and it's still surprising that because um, one of the key pieces that they had to um, critique and write on was a piece I wrote about the 30th anniversary of the deaths in custody. And um, these students have read everything, right? Theory, everything. And they still don't understand how discriminatory um, the legal system is in this country. Um, and, and, the, and the issue is to try and, um, I think the major component of it is um, how do we get people to empathize with with our people and what's happened to us. Um, you know, the biggest mistake of fact in this country is that how this country was seated, it was stolen, and, and, we, and it's really difficult to discuss that in this country. So um, that's, that's just a real quick overview of what's happening. Um, stories we should be telling, I think, is there's a recent bench book, a um, judgment book recently done, Indigenous judgment book, um, where uh, Nikki, Nicole Watson and um, Heather Douglas had an art grant and they got indigenous um, you know, experts or excellence academics, whatever you want to call it, who wrote on key um, cases over the duration and it was from an indigenous perspective. And, and that, those are the sort of um, things that we need to see in our curriculum. Um, Non-indigenous people reading these and, and really feeling um, the issues that, that our people face, not only just the legal process and all that, but how, how difficult it is for our people to put their hand up to have um, 
them torn apart by governments, you know, numbers of solicitors, you know, um, ripping them apart, basically making them out to be um, liars to, to, to make their case. Um, one of them is like my aunt, who was in the Cabello Gunner um, stolen generation case, who after that felt that she um, was made out to be a liar and, um, and never really was the same after that. And those are the sort of things our people have to, when they stand up for our communities, they, they, that's what they endure and, and, it's, and it's constant. And if we look at the current coronal that's running in, in Victoria, um, the families have one or two um, solicitors representing them, usually on pro bono, and the, the government has like, can be up to 50 plus representing their arguments. And no matter how many recommendations we get out of these place, out of these, um, you know, these, these coronials or in, um, royal commissions, um, it's, it's just like a kicking down a can exercise where they, they're just there but nothing ever gets implemented. So I'll just leave it at that and we'll go back to you. No worries. Thank you all for those responses. Eddie, there was actually one thing that I wanted to unpack a little bit further that you mentioned and um, it was an important point, but we've got a lot of teachers and educators in the room tonight and you mentioned about the, um, I guess, starting the process of embedding Indigenous perspectives and content into the, you know, into your teaching material in the in the law school. I mean, what was the first step to sort of doing that? How did you, how did you start the process? I mean, look, they, they, they had a review, so you have to be respectful that a review was done. An Indigenous person was involved in that review, um, and then they followed through with key, key recommendations, uh, pointed myself, um, and, then, and giving me support to um, go through and try and establish um, some of those key um, recommendations. One was establish the hub, which, which um, one of the big part for me coming from community and working in um, community control is establishing relationship with community. Um, you know, with the treaty um, process, we're working closely with the assembly, the Euro Commission. I've just come off a Royal Commission, so I fully understand the evidence that's taken and, and, and how that impacts on our people. Trying to educate the university itself in regards to what that means on, on um, you know, cultural safety and, and everything else within that organisation. And then, um, you know, I, I've learned heaps from um, key staff who, who, who are sympathetic in this space, but that, you know, the usual trick is to um, teach the core content and then say, oh, if you've got time, read the Indigenous stuff. So it's not important, right? But that should be, if we look right across the justice system, our people um, dominate every sphere of it. Um, the biggest issue at the moment is constitutional law, right? Our identity and everything, and very rarely touched on. And um, it should be a main content of discussion uh, with, with property law. Um, you know, native title, is, it's, it's made like it's the pinnacle of, um, of property law, when in fact, um, if you talk to Indigenous people, they'll just roll their eyes, and who've been involved with it, it, it basically it, um, causes, you know, more heartache with our mob and, um, and, and, and anyone who's benefiting from it is usually anthropologists and um, apologise if there are any anthropologists in here or, or lawyers who um, make a real... And, and what happens then is our families are usually divided and conquered and, 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 and don't talk to each other ever again. And, and, and they've, they've gone through, you know, stolen generation and everything, but something like this then just rips the whole family apart, right? And so for me as a former lawyer and that, those are real sad because our families never um, can really get back together. So, so those are the sort of things you try and bring into the university, and, and, and these three will speak later, but um, bringing Indigenous content into the university just doesn't mean um, readings, it actually means bringing black faces into the classroom and, and hearing um, that, that knowledge that's with that, those faces. And because, um, you know, I always use this. Uh, from a friend in Canada, when she went to university, her elders told her, um, don't let your, um, your studies get in the way of your education. <laughs> and, and I think that, that really, um, you know, realms true on, 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 on Indigenous people. No, thank you, Eddie. Um, I guess the second question builds on the, on the first one that we just asked, but um, what do you see as the relationship between the past and the future in the stories we need to tell? I'm not sure if you want to lead that one off, Nikki. 
Oh yeah. All oh, right. Just a just a light just a, one. Just a light one. Just, just a light one for you. Relationship. Just I saw you with the microphone. So Spatial temporality. Just to kind of kick us all off. Yeah. All right. The relationship between the past and the future. All right. All right. Back up. Buckle up, kids. You know, I think it, this is actually an incredibly difficult question to ask because it goes to the nature of Indigenous ontologies and epistemologies, right? Like we're looking at ways in which we understand the, the past to be our guide for the future. You know, that I think there are so many First Nations peoples around the world who have um, proverbs and sayings and stories about the way that you know the past is the way that you know what the future holds from it, right? When you understand the constituent parts of the world as being interrelated, then you do what you can to maintain those interrelations and that means attending to the histories of things. And so I think for me it becomes most clear when we try and tell white people's stories <laughs> because the stories that we have are really powerful normative structures, right? As stories around the world from everywhere are normative, they're meant to control people's behaviour and change you in particular kinds of ways. And so we assume, I think, that when we tell white people a story, we expect their behaviour to change because they understand something a little bit more of history and they understand how they should conduct themselves in the future because Indigenous peoples are rather focused on proper conduct, yeah, and how you should walk through the world and how you should treat other people and the human and non-living world human and non-human world but that's not how non-indigenous people think about stories it's not how non-indigenous people think about the past and it's not how non-indigenous people think about the future and so the pathway through that is not to get white people to think more about the past like black people do yeah that, that's weird and gross and culturally appropriation -y and all sorts of different things but I think it is to walk into a world where we teach people that it is okay for that world to be complex. Yeah, I think so much of what we see is the, the much of global capital simplifies our lives and our ways of knowing. We can't kind of cognitively appreciate the role that complexity plays. And so we, we can't kind of then wrap our heads around the idea that knowledge systems are incommensurable, that there are things that we can't know and that there are ways of walking into the future that maybe some people might have a different kind of a handle on how to do and how not. So that's my little spiel on the past and the future and spatiotemporality and Indigenous rights. <laughs> there we go. Zach? I'm going to stop going second, I swear. I really am. <laughs> uh, if you don't mind, can I can I link this with the um, discussion that we were just having before around curriculum? Because um, I, I can't improve on what I've heard already. Uh, I'm not even going to try. Um, I, I don't know whether anyone noticed, but I'm I'm the person on the, the panel who's not a doctor, um, <laughs> and I've, I've become acutely aware of that in the last 15 minutes. <laughs> How, however, however, um, embedding embedding perspectives in curriculum. And, and building uh, global knowledge around uh, our shared history. Let's be real, it is our shared history. It's our, our culture, but our collective shared history. Um, that's going to happen before university if we want to make a difference. It's, it's got to happen in sectors that, that uh, you know, I'm working in at the moment. Um, and the problem with telling stories and, and, and um, having an, a, an Indigenous expectation that that story is going to have an impact um, is that we are a small population group. So we're a very small population group and we're significantly dispersed. I just want to say in, in Victoria, we're, we're, we're the most dispersed Aboriginal population in the entire country. And in fact, I can, I can tell you this year we've got Koori students in over 88% of our government schools right now. And, and over 40% of those government schools have less than six Koori kids in them. So we are dispersed, we are culturally and socially isolated and we don't have um, a, a significant level of uh, system-wide or statewide community infrastructure to try and help bolster that. So what we need to do to try and connect the past and the future is have um, a, an opportunity for society for deep listening. And, and I don't want to preempt uh, the work that's coming out of the York Truth and Justice Commission. I also don't want to pre preempt the work that's coming out of, of um, treaty. But it, I, I think as a society we're, we're mature enough. We're mature enough to know there are things we need to learn, there's things we need to listen to. Um, and if we, if we lean in on that discomfort, and there will be discomfort, um, there will be discomfort in, in truth. Um, and then just have a bit of personal reflection about what is my individual 
and then you're a part of a collective, whether it's family, work, a, a community, what is my collective responsibility to that knowledge that I've learned or to that, that um, uh, reflection that I have? And I want to now take it into the, into the future and bring it back, Sariani, to, to you know, that wonderful future yeah. that you were, you were talking about yeah. before. Um, how are you raising your families? How are you raising the future? Um, you know, uh, being greedy now and taking all the time, but I want, uh, I've met a lot of um, really well-meaning, genuinely nice people who, um, who are victims of their time. And um, I'll, I'll use the, the word racist, not, not as a judgment of intent, because I don't think that's fair. I'm not a mind reader, I, I don't know intent, but as an objective observation of the behavior, language, and experiences that I've had in, in my life. Um, I, I have either become milder or, or gotten tired, I'm not entirely sure which, but I am, I am more understanding now when I talk to um, people who haven't had the exposure that we're getting now around uh, you know, what, what Australia was really like, uh, about the um, incredible turmoil and trauma that has happened in this country. I think it's, to a certain extent, unfair to, to judge people if they've not had that opportunity but you all have that opportunity now and your children will have that opportunity the the embedding in the curriculum the connecting the past to the present and then moving it on to the future i don't think leaves an excuse for continued racism in this country i think that's kind of where we need to be thinking about what what comes next ask me another question <laughs> <laughs> okay um keep it moving all right, well, this one... I'll answer what I want anyway. Okay, all right. <laughs> I like that approach. I'm going to keep that in mind next time I'm on a panel. Uh, we're talking about education specifically tonight, so how does the education system need to change to enable these different stories to be told? And you mentioned whiteness before. I mean, yeah. we know what whiteness is, but yeah. do, does everyone who's listening know what we um, mean by that? No, I don't want to talk about that. I'll incorporate that. But what I want to do say is that as an educator, and I want to use the broad brush interpretation of education, you know, because we're engaging with institutions. And so institutions can um, very easily slip into that track of um, institutional um, racism. Um, I'm often surprised that we don't talk about ideological racism as well which is the stuff that determines Westminster law. It's the stuff that determines how pedagogy is created within this country um, and epistemology. Um, what I do want to say as, um, as somebody who also has responsibility for indigenising curriculum and leading the university in that process, so I'm, I'm really interested in that moment when the non-Indigenous ally or otherwise says, I don't want to make a mistake. I don't go into that space because I don't want to make a mistake. And I want to talk about the place of, um, and I was talking to Viv about this, who's the dean, who's the head of the School of Education at Monash. We were talking about this today and I think that's a really interesting moment and I've been trying to grapple with that. What is happening at that particular moment? And um, I was able to um, revisit um, Tuck and Yang this afternoon. They wrote a great paper in 2012 about decolonisation. Um, is not a metaphor and I would highly recommend it for everybody within this room. And they give, um, uh, they name a, a number of case studies and I looked at those case studies and I was, you know, um, they named the, the settler um, coloniser. Can I just say to the panel here, I, I, I'm a little bit troubled by that concept of settler co colonial as well. Um, because what's the corollary? We are not settled as Indigenous people, you know, within the nation. So um, I think there's, I think there's a, a presumption within the, the use of that particular term. I do want to say um, in reading those particular um, phenomena, case um, identifiers, markers within the 
the the Tuck and um, Yang article, I didn't see the non-Indigenous person that I'm trying to um, know how to um, move into the decolonising space. So they talked about, and I think that was, um, uh, you read that article, because I saw your head nobbing, nodding. It was at Winane, Winane's thesis. Yeah. With Nain's thesis, who talks about that move into innocence, you know, and I think what's happening, and I'm not, I'm not quite sure, and I have to think about this a little bit more. I don't know that it's a move to innocence. What is happening here in Australia when you've got, and I don't think it's resistance either, you know, and I don't think it's that sort of moment of passive acceptance either. I think there's something else that, it's, that is happening in that moment. I'm not quite sure what it is, but it is a moment. And it is a moment that really characterises those who work in the field of education, irregardless of the discipline, all right? And I think we need to trouble that because if we do not, then what will happen to decolonisation is what um, Tuck and Yang is saying is that it becomes a metaphor. And so all of us here, you know, the decolonisation of the law curriculum, the decolonisation of um, education, you know, we need to be able to um, step into this space and think about it much more deeply and find out what the hell is going on here. All right? And I can see starts. For those of you who saw my keynote address at AARE, um, not that I'm big note myself here, but um, I just, I just want to revisit that because I called for white people to centre Indigenous sovereignty within themselves for us to be able to move to that space of transformation. Now, if that does not happen, you can kiss decolonisation goodbye. You know, because you're still going to pick up reports. You're going to teach the next generation of whatever discipline the same sort of ideological base of knowledge that you were brought up on that hasn't changed within the university here and now. We've got to do a flip on all of this stuff. Otherwise, we are going to perpetuate what colonisation has done to the generations previously. And at the core of this, for me, as an Indigenous person, <clears throat> is that no non-Indigenous person, coloured or otherwise, lives in this country and has a livelihood without the hard conversation that our land has never been ceded. So you need to think about that. What does it mean to live on Aboriginal land? What does it mean when all of us draw our pay packets from a colonial bastion that has planted itself on Indigenous land and pays no reparation that you're scrapping around for two bob to be able to write a bloody curriculum. That stuff has to stop. There has to be deep thinking about that. No non-Indigenous person exists in this country without benefiting from the theft of Indigenous lands. That's what we have to start with. And for me, that's the start. That's the the green light in terms of decolonisation. I'm so glad you posed that question, Art, and didn't go with my original one. And that was a very good good response and very uh, a thoughtful one, I think, for everyone to consider. Um, I might go to you next, Eddie, for the first one. And you sort of touched on this before, but. 
World, worldwide, are there uh, any good examples of colonial settings that have managed to do any of the work that we're discussing tonight? To think through First Nations people, their knowledges, languages, cultures in the future of those decolonising countries, to your, to your knowledge or to your experience? Uh, so new to me, really. Um, look, there's mob doing really good stuff everywhere, right? Um, and doing it tough and, um, you know, we have people getting on their own and, and putting money and building their own schools and, and, and teaching language in their schools and, and, and re revitalising culture and everything. So like, there's, there's a whole heap of really good stuff going on. And, um, uh, but, you know, if, like, if you look in the legal space um, in, in Canada, there's have a whole legal um, degree that, that's you know centered on indigenous um, curriculum and um, and you come out with a a law degree that you can um, practice law with so that, you know there's, there's a lot of respect there um, obviously we're a long way off in this country on that um, and as aunt said um, we struggle um, you know again uh, you know, Chief Justice, former Chief Justice Brennan has just passed and um, I'm, I'm at a loss when um, we have Indigenous people saying what a great job he's done in this space. And um, for me, um, you know, the, the, the judgment is, um, could have went further and, and then there's been a lot of Indigenous critique on the judgment. Um, you can read those. Um, but... It comes back to that you know, um, this country was seated on a lie. Um, the legal system won't adjudicate against itself because it can't fracture the skeletal principle of our, our, our um, colonial legal system. And so basically they won't, they won't touch the, dis, you know, the question of the mistake of fact that the land was basically stolen, right? So, because it'll, it'll bust, bust their system, right? And, and so they won't even acknowledge it, they won't, I mean, they acknowledge it in the fact that they say um, we were here, but they won't question, you know, their law as being um, built on, on base. You know, it's practically fragile, right? What it's what it's built on. And as an Indigenous person, when you do study law, it's really hard to sit there and listen to that stuff for a whole, whole three and a half years. And but, um, you know. We, we have to endure that and, and, and continue to fight on because our, our people are doing that everywhere now. And, um, you know, recent High Court around Love Tom's checking identity, there's, there's little cracks there around sovereignty um, that, you know, possibly could be, um, you know, look, looked into more closely. However, the, the, the um, decision had an in, the ink hadn't even dried and um, the former government had um, is, is gone back to appeal that decision and, um, you know, and because they, they changed, the bench changed and they were able to put two, two new um, High Court judges on, on the bench. So, you know, this is the way the system works in this country in regards to, um, you know, respecting Indigenous people's um, legal, legal space in this country. We, we abide by their laws and they continue to ignore that there's a legal pluralism in this country, right? Whether you're in an urban environment or, or remote, people are still practicing their culture. Um, it may be a hybrid of, of, what, of what it was in some places, but no culture is stagnant, right? And our people um, continue to go on. And I think that, that underpins where we're at in this country. Um, and our, if I just talk about the legal um, education. I see a lot of those coming through are, are from private schools. Um, they may live in the, the um, state that they go into the uni, but then they go to a um, college. So they, they, they go and live in a college even though they could live at home. And um, I didn't go to a sandstone uni. I well, everywhere I went was around practicability, right? Where you live, um, affordability, um, and, and everything else that comes with it being indigenous. Um, 
but they, these learnings they have in these um, colleges and that are, are reinforced as they go through these systems, right? And um, they, they, they don't understand how, what it is to maybe sleep in a house of 20 to 30 people, um, you know, not knowing if someone's going to pay the rent this week or, or have food on the table, you know, or eat the same food for a week sort of thing, right? And that, that, that really doesn't prepare them to um, work in the system, right? And, and, and as Aunt said, have understanding of um, what it is to be Indigenous in this country. So I'll just leave that at that. No, thank you, Eddie. Nikki, did you have anything you wanted to add to that question? Um, to the question which was... Oh. <laughs> Just around, uh, I guess, <laughs> sorry, any uh, international examples that you think are best practice in this space? I mean, I, I went to UBC in, I think, 2019, so it was pre-COVID, and I did get the impression, I mean, I wasn't there for that long, but I did get the impression that they might have been a bit further ahead in where we are. I mean, everyone that I met with there introduced themselves as a settler, you know, but basically um, acknowledged the traditional owners and... There was even a real differentiation between Indigenous people there that they would talk about being a settler too to that country if they weren't from there. I mean, um, they had treaty in place. I mean, albeit with only a few different clan groups, it was, and it's been a long process. But they, it, it gave me the impression that it might have been further ahead than where we are in Australia. Do you have any sort of knowledge around best practice yeah. examples that you've come across? Well, I don't know about best practice. Um, I think that the, the the story of resurgence and the story of rights is really different in a lot of places because I think by the time the British got here, they'd kind of perfected the cruelty. Yeah, they'd been to enough places and they'd kind of, you know, they'd worked out their kind of strategy here. So the things that happened here, I think, are different, you know, because of the brutality that was refined in other colonies in other places. You know, and so our pathway is going to look a little different, I think, to the pathways in other places. But I think that there are things which are universals no matter where we go. And like I said, I don't know if they're, I don't know if they're practice, but there are the things that we hold true, right? Um, language, right, for example. So Kuroko, Papa Maori, schools, like grandmothers, grandparents taking their kids out of the mainstream schooling system and just, you know, picking up workbooks, you know, at the news agency and pasting over the Tereo Maori in the evenings, right, to make sure those kids knew their language. The bilingual schools in the Northern Territory, the Gumbangir bilingual school that's just about to open the first bilingual school in New South Wales ever, you know, is just about to open. I mean, there are things happening around the world that aren't, that never even make it onto the radar in this country. I remember a couple of years ago, the University of Technology at Sydney opened up a college, just a residential school for Aboriginal kids. And everyone lost their mind. Like, everyone lost their mind, right? That there would just be a safe place for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids Indians. to sleep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, and I'm like, there are, you know, there are like indigenous universities, right, in other parts of the world. Like we get that, right? Yeah, we get that Aboriginal schools, indigenous schools, First Nations owned, controlled, run schools exist. Yeah, but not here. We don't get that. Yeah. So it's not that there is best practice in some places and not here. It's that there are rights that exist in other places that we don't have here. And so we know, we know when kids, it doesn't matter what language you, gr you grew up with, we know that if you become literate in your first language, then we understand what happens as a result of that for your literacy and outcome rates in all sorts of other things. Right? We know if you're connected to your family and culture, you do better. Like we know, we, don't, we have the answers. We understand the research. We know what works. It's not best practice, it's just research. Nikki, can I ask a follow-up to that? Yeah, How I mean. do you think we grow the awareness amongst people? If, you know, these things exist internationally, how do we grow the presence here and grow the understanding here? Oh, look, well, deep, I, I think that's <laughs> a... Opinion. 
There's a, a long answer to the short question of Australian parochialism, isn't there? So, you know, I think we have to learn, we have to be able to tell these stories about things that are normal in other places, you know, so that we can also tell the stories about the things that are normal here, whether, they, whether that is good or, or bad. So we know that cops get sent to Aboriginal communities to get trained, right? Like, we understand that the school to prison pipeline is well established and that, that that's, that's a thing, right? So we, there are stories about things that we know happen here, that we know define Indigenous lives in particular kinds of ways. So telling that story, learning from other people about the kinds of things that they have done and not getting sidetracked by the conversation about who has a treaty and who doesn't. Oh, you know how often I hear the conversation, we can't do what they do in America. Yeah, we can't do what, we can't replicate what happens in Turtle Island because they have casinos. For the love of God, you know, that is not what determines a successful well indigenous community with control over its services and education systems yeah so the more that we can tell these stories i think the better we will be and the better we will get at telling our own story of resurgence as well did you have anything anything to add to that Zach? yeah if you don't mind uh, and look I, I i think i want to bring this back locally there is um so best practice no i don't i don't i don't think there is best practice there is there is burgeoning practice there is good practice uh, how many people here are actually teachers you're yeah, fantastic excellent and I, and I don't want you to be afraid of what's going on in the school or, or feel like it's an insurmountable effort um, the, the the effort needs to be accelerated absolutely needs to be accelerated and and uh, I may, may sound incredibly selfish but I've got a, a, a son who's 18 Zach junior um, who's at university at the moment studying business because uh, he's smarter than me he didn't study education um, and uh, but however however <laughs> he's, he's picking my, my retirement home. Um, however, I also have a four-year-old who, or, or, or yeah, four-year-old who's just gone to um, kindergarten for the first time. So I've got I've, I've got bookends. Um, really poor maths. So I'm going to have grandkids before I get rid of my kids. I, I, my <laughs> wife didn't think about that. Um, however, it, we must continue to try. We must continue to do. We must continue to improve because I do not want my boys going through the same stuff that I went through. And and whilst I, I I've spent a lot of money and a lot of time getting, uh, you know, a, 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 I would say a good, but it's it, one of my degrees is Monash, so a good education, a good mainstream education. Um, I left school very early. I didn't finish VCE, and being a mature age student with a young family trying to come, I don't want that for my child. I, I don't want that to be the option because there was an assumption about my capability, an assumption about my commitment, an assumption about what I should be that led me to being informally expelled and encouraged into a mechanics uh, apprenticeship. Now, I have a mechanics certificate. I got the certificate for in small spark engine maintenance or whatever it was back then. Um, but you don't want me fixing your car. I'm going to break it. I, diagnose, absolutely, I'm your man. But you don't want me fixing the car. And quite clearly, the, the career that I've chosen, um, or landed in, sorry, uh, is, is indicative that, that um, you know, there were, there were my aspirations that, that were not being observed. So best practice, no. Um, burgeoning good practice, yes. And, and continue to try it. But if you want to know how to do it, talk to the community. Like, as I mentioned, we are highly dispersed. It is highly likely in the classroom, if you don't have an Aboriginal person, you're going to end up with one in the next five years at some point. It, it, it's going to happen. So get to know the story, get to know the person. It, it can be daunting, as Aunt said earlier, um, where to start and that, that, that fear paralysis. It's the bane of my existence. Um, it is absolutely the bane of my existence. 19 years, it, uh, and it is probably the most common thing I hear from teachers um, in, in primary schools, secondary colleges, um, uh, in, in TAFEs. Uh, want to do, but don't know where to start, so I don't want to don't want to get it wrong. How do you think we feel every day when we go to school? When I go to work? When I when I present in places like this? I don't want to get it wrong either, but it, it's worth doing, and it's worth doing not just for my boys not just for, for your family. It's, it's worth doing for your kids and, and your family. So please keep trying. And I, I know this sounds a bit corny, and, and I'm talking too much. Uh, I know this sounds a little bit, bit corny, but um, if I didn't have faith that you're going to change it, I wouldn't be 20 years into this. I really wouldn't. I'd have gone and done something else. There, there's other things I could do. I'm 
bloody go, go back to uni and study law. I'm, yeah, I'm collecting right. degrees. Get a law I haven't got one from Melbourne, so I, you know, I, I could do that. So um, it's a really long way of saying best practice, no. And if you look internationally as well, which, which we do do at the Department of Education and Training, we, we, we do do a fair amount of global um, uh, gazing. Um, there is awesome practice around identity and acknowledgement and recognition. But then you look at social determinants and there's still a disparity. So we, we, in, in this country, in this state, in my system, I don't want to sacrifice culture for academic performance and competitiveness. I don't want to do that. We've, we've got to find a way to do both. And I don't think any jurisdiction's found that yet. But we have an opportunity through the, the, the um, assembly, through you know, the, the treaty, um, the uh, sorry, Treaty Authority in other matters bill was just passed this week. It was just heard in Parliament. I was listening to it today. Um, a novel authority, a novel business. We're doing things differently and please keep doing things differently. No, thank you, Zach. Aunt? Last you, word? Yeah, last word. Okay. Um, I think we do have to think about... Um, decolonisation in um, very different ways. Um, I know Melita's online. Melita, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this when I do the Dean's Address at um, University of Melbourne. But I think we've got, we've got... We've got social documents out there that are calling for change, right? So... The Uluru Statement from the Heart. Yes, it's going to lead to constitutional change, but one of the fundamental tenets within that is a call for truth telling. So I want to know the extent to which, because because part of the a priori condition of truth telling is that there needs to be very hard conversations, okay, and. Part of that hard conversation, um, you know, I spoke about previously when I was responding. But um, I actually don't think this nation is very well prepared for those um, because it has lent into a right politics, a right wing politics, rather than... Um, um, discussions that are liberatory for for Indigenous peoples, OK? Um, and I think... Um, and this is not... I'm not being a pessimist, you know? Like, um, you think about the... It's 2022 and part of the deal with writing Indigenous curriculum is that we have to write guides to be able to have relationships with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I mean, theoretically, that has to come from some base, huh? Um, and so... Um, there's, that, there's that need to be able to have card, hard conversations. There's a need to be able to have um, non... white people's readiness to be able to receive those conversations as well. I mean, what I was trying to point to earlier was that um, white people have to give up virtue. White people, do, white people don't own virtue, you know. Um, they just don't. There's just a lot of white people. And so it looks like white people own virtue. You don't. You don't white people don't own... Whiteness doesn't own virtue, all right? But to step away from that space of virtuousness... Um, to be able to um, have clean binungs in my in my language, have clean ears to be able to hear what it is that um, Indigenous people are saying. We work in a collective. That's part of the joy of being an Aboriginal person, is that we both have a collect we have a collective identity, but we also have an in individual identity. And the collective white identity needs to start working for us. So when you have an expectation about the Uluru Statement from the heart and it's not, you know, it's sliding, 
that's when you need to get on the phone and you need to talk to these, you know, Teal Independents or um, in Brisbane, our place is green. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you need to get on the phone as a collective. That's your individual act of decolonisation because ideologically you've thought about this and so you need to be able to do that work so that we move to a position where our liberation is real within this country. Okay? So, um, you know, then that becomes a... Um, um, the agentic work of decolonisation that is otherwise not thought through whilst people are saying, I'm really too nervous to take a step here in case I make a mistake. You know, whiteness already made a mistake in this country. <laughs> Big one. All right? Own that. Now, step into some other best pra some best practice, you know? Whether it is legal best practice, educational best practice. Thank you so much, Aunt, and, and to the panel as well. I mean, that's that's the end of my question. I promised this was, was going to be interactive, so we will throw it open to the to the question and those um, listening on, in online. So the way I might do it is just to, to ask one question of the audience here, and then I'll jump up here behind me and um, read one from the screen. And don't forget to use your YouTube comments and, and the Slido poll. But um, I'll start with uh, an audience question here, and then uh, we can go from there. Does anyone want to kick us off? I've got a whole host if anyone's uh, shy, a whole heap of backup ones. Um, we do? Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll jump up to the screen. Sorry, so just so I'm not looking around. So, all right, so the first one um, is actually to do with the Uluru statement, which we have touched on a little bit, but, um, oh no, sorry, it's not. It's, when reflecting on your journey, what are some of the best examples of school? Oh, it's jumping around a bit there. How's that? How do I? <laughs> got to be quick. Either I've got to be a quick, quick reader. <laughs> oh, okay. We might give it a little bit of time for voting to come through in that case, then, just so that I don't get halfway through another question and it uh, jumps off. But I might start with one that I've got here, which is the Uluru statement from the heart calls for truth telling. And what do you believe are the hard conversations that are need to be had in order that there is truth and trust between Indigenous and non Indigenous peoples? And we sort of touched on a little bit of that already, but is there anything that you'd like to, to add to that? I can see you. Grabbing the mic there, aren't? Oh no, readjusting. Yeah, no, we've um, we've got a deal that I don't ever go after her. Okay, yeah, yeah good, good deal. Um, the biggest truth, and it's not about it's not a truth. Yeah, so it's not a, it's actually not a truth about um, uh, our, our history. It's a truth about um, life in general, and the, the the fundamental truth is that sorry doesn't make it okay, and, and we don't have to immediately forgive because of that. Um, sorry is, is an incredibly important statement. It's an incredibly important acknowledgement that it was real, it happened, and it shouldn't have happened. But it, it's, it's the first step. And, and the, problem, the problem is that as a society, and, and I see this all the time, in particular in schools, kids are great at it. If, if a kid gets in a fight, and primary schools are awesome for this, so one, one kid hits another kid, and you say, know, why'd you hit that kid? And might say sorry, and uh, you know, the student will say sorry because you're the teacher and, and there's that power dynamic and then the, the immediately without being prompting what's the first words that come out of the other the victim's mouth no no the victim's mouth yeah that's okay it's not okay that's that's the beginning truth that i think as a society we need to get onto because without that acceptance that it's it, it's okay not to be okay it's okay for things not to be immediately forgiven we're not going to get to that next step we'll just start defending whether or not issues happened and whether or not why can't you get over it it's a great point. Although I think these conversations about truth telling are a little difficult um, because I think there is often a an assumed connection between the individual process of being honest 
of unburdening one's self from perhaps, you know, post-mortal repercussions of lying. And the history of truth-telling and religious institutions around the world, um, particularly the way that the Catholic Church was involved, for example, in South Africa, um, the role of truth-telling, for example, in German reunification, South Africa, so on and, and so forth, right, yeah? So there's this, there's this assumption that telling the truth, your truth, being honest about the things that have happened to you or that you've done, works the same way at a social level that somehow we can collectively unburden ourselves of the guilt yeah, which is not what Makarata says, and I'm not a legal expert on Makarata by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, that's what my and that over you in a second. All right. Um, but we, we assume these things work the same way, and they just don't. So what are we doing when we ask complex social institutions to acknowledge their, the role that they have played in perpetrating not abstract harms, very real harms upon very real people. And we ask those people then to tell those stories, effectively re-traumatising themselves, perhaps with very little effective psychosocial and cultural support. And we document them for the purposes of retrieval. Yeah, so that that is done then for the fact that we can go back, like the Royal Commission, into Aboriginal deaths in custody and we can read those stories and we know what's happened. And what? So what? So Deloitte can come along 25 years later and do a review of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Custody and say, oh, actually, all of those 339 recommendations got implemented, done. Yeah. Right? As if. So we're asking the truth, we're asking the process of truth-telling to do a great deal of heavy lifting for us without necessarily any clue about what it is that we ask of people when they partake in that and the promises that we then make to them about what happens as a result of their, in, of their contribution to the truth-telling process. So that may sound like I'm not here for truth-telling. <laughs> that's, that's not what I'm saying at all. But I just think we need to be very, very careful about the work that we think that it is doing for us and what we think we will be able to do with it as a result. I, I didn't necessarily see, within the context of Uluru's statement from the heart, I saw that as a need for the nation to be able to tell a different story nationally than what it's, what it's telling at the moment, you know. So, um, so we don't perpetuate. Um, colonising practices. So we stop saying um, Cook discovered Australia, you know. Um, um, we stop, you know, those sorts of, of narratives, um, they need to be stopped. That's, that, you know, so I didn't, I wasn't thinking about truth telling in the, term, in the sense of, of individual um, requirement but certainly the hard conversations that need to be had, you know. And, and for any, any other thing, um, in spite, you know, um, not just for cultural safety and stuff like that, just so that I can go to bloody work and enjoy a day, you know, without... <laughs> yeah, once, one day, yeah. No, thank you for that. Uh, I mean, even... Uh I've done a couple of posts on workplace, um, you know, around um, significant dates and that sort of thing. And for the most part, there's been a lot of positive momentum, but I've still had negative comments on there. Um, and, you know, we're a university with uh, supposedly uh, progressive views and we've still got those staff that existed. So, yeah, I think that um, rings true. We might go to one of the questions that are up here, um, which is, and maybe I'll throw to you first, Eddie, on this one. But re when reflecting on your journey, what are some of the best examples of school leadership in reconciliation that you've come across? Uh, I just wrote a piece about reconciliation and what do Indigenous people have to reconcile? So, and um, every year we have a week where people are sorry for us and 
want to talk about reconciling then that week's gone and it's we're back to normal um, so I'd, I'd say not not too much um, and and I'd go back to the previous question because I, I had a few things to say as well is that um, there's been a lot of truth telling already from black fellows all right and, and the issue is about who's listening and um, we've had the bring them home report. Uh, we've had the deaths in custody report, and the Deloitte's report was a desktop report, and it was um, ripped apart by um, s uh, several academics highlighting how how bad it was done. Um, you know, we've had the royal commissions everywhere around child protection, and in every state almost. And um, you know, people have poured their hearts out and told the truth. We've had an apology, and since the apology, the um, child removal has gone through the roof. And, and it's, um, you know, the Family Matters reports that are done basically highlight that, you know, by 2037, 30, it, it'll be triple. So, you know, um, it, we talk about reconciliation. I think we go back to what Aunt was saying in regards to, you know, it's, it's up to, the wider population who really put their hand up and, and, and consider what will keep our governments accountable on this stuff. Um, we allow these huge um, Royal Commissions, costly exercises, huge um, recommendations that are ignored and, and we wonder why things are worse than ever and I think, um, you know, and, you know, basically our kids are going to continue to see this stuff, I'm sorry to say. Because um, if you look at the stats, our um, Indigenous males of 18 years are more likely to be incarcerated than they are to go to um, university. And um, our women are the fastest growing incarcerated population in this country, practically in the world. And our children are making up, you know, predominantly at least 50% of the um, children incarcerated in this country. So. Um, I'm not really sure we talk about reconcil reconciling until we really generally um, make some real effort here. And I think, you know, today with the treaty formulation and the, and the um, bipartisan um, stuff with the um, government and, and the opposition is, is a start. Um, and, and But I, I also say that the current government has withdrawn its um, push around youth um, justice and are looking at tough on crime for the coming election, which, you know, it makes it really difficult for Indigenous people who are at the table negotiating um, a treaty to really um, look at a government when, we, when those sort of things are, are popping up all the time. So one party's coming to the table with clean hands and the other, um, you, you wonder where they're at. And, and, and that, 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 that's, that's a bit of a worry. And, um, um, it's a concern, and, and that's how this um, electoral cycle works in this country. And unfortunately, for Indigenous people, um, three percent of the population doesn't um, make a real big vote count. Yeah, I think spot on, Eddie. Did anyone want to add anything to that? Zach? Yeah, yeah, I've had I've had heaps of great examples of really strong leadership in in what I call conciliation. Because I, I agree with you, I don't you can't reconcile if you were never consoled in the in the first place. Um, and I don't, I don't want to sound pessimistic. I've been out of school for a very long time. Um, none of them were, were white, you know. Uh, uh, Aunty Vera Briggs, um, Aunty Sylvia Parsons, you know, community members and, and leaders, and, and the bulk of them are my, uh, you know, aunties, yeah, our aunties. Um, you know, uh, I'll throw a couple of blokes in there too, <laughs> Uncle Lionel Bamblett. Um, you know, the, the, these leaders who have dedicated their lives um, and are, are very largely responsible for. Uh, well, certainly me sitting here lecturing people. Yeah. Um, so if you want someone to blame. But yeah, I, I've had some, some great leaders on reconciliation through my life. I, I still see them. The, the disappointing thing in my education is that they were, um, they were Aboriginal staff at the school. They were community elders com contributing to the school. And I, and I must say, they were contributing to the school with no recompense. And, and I, I paid a lot of money for my non-Indigenous education. I think our Indigenous education 
is worth mm. something too. And, you know, we go, it goes to all those things that you were talking about, Eddie. Um, you know, recognising, respecting, and valuing that that organic intellectual intellectualism that um, that that we bring and that our elders bring. Yeah, I think again, great points. Did you have anything to add, Aunt? No. <coughs> <laughs> We've got about 15 minutes to go, and uh, oh, no, we, no, we, oh, we do. Yeah, it's only about 15. But um, the audience were a little bit shy last time around. Does anyone want to ask a question from the floor? Sorry, I have a question, but I also sort of know that there's not really an answer. <laughs> um, I, I've also recently read Tuck and Yang's article and found it very mind opening -y, which really loved it as well. Um, but this is where I know it's not, <laughs> you can't really ask if decolonisation is not a metaphor, what does it look like? Because that's kind of the point of the article is that we can't ask that question. But as a non-Indigenous institution, which I would say Monash 99.9999% still is, how could, how, I don't want to ask it, but how can, how can we how can we make it more than a metaphor? I got a list. You got a list? Yeah, I got a list. You got a list? Yeah, I got a list. Yeah, we got lists. Well, you know, I mean, let's let's go back to what um, Eddie was saying about some of that statistical stuff, and that's you know um, the failure there is not on us. The failure is with the white systems that we have to actually, we're forced to engage with as Indigenous people, right? So as Eddie was speaking, I was thinking, what, what is happening here? What does it say about a nation when the incarceration rate of Indigenous women is escalating? Are we so dangerous that 50% of the incarceration rate of children in this country can be attributed to Indigenous children? And we also know what is happening in terms of the so-called child protection um, strategies taken up by our welfare departments, right? So what is happening to families within this, um, within this nation, right? So you ask, what can we do, right? What, what does it look like? And we've got this. It's quite simple. Give us back our fucking kids for a start, okay? Simple. White people got their kids, we want our kids. Give us back our kids. Give us back our health. Hey? We die so much earlier than everybody else. Give us back our health. Give us back our legal rights. Give us back our, um, what do you say? Our, um, yeah, give us back the space for us to be able to shine in terms of our organic intellectualism that was passed on from our old people, okay? Give us back um, our joy, you know? Give us back the space so that we can elevate our knowledge systems to help this country heal, which has been destroyed and some parts of it are on the brink because of the other knowledge system that operates within this country. Give us back our land. Yes. So, you know, Universities are all on Aboriginal land all the time. And last time I checked, they didn't pay rent for that land. They did not pay that rent to the um, 
elders, the knowledge holders of the places that that land is on. Um, as far as I'm aware, UBC is the only place that has adopted the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as a governing charter um, to arrange their Indigenous, non-Indigenous peoples relations in those places. Um, universities do not, as a rule, educate people about what it means to enact self-determination. They do not teach Indigenous people what it means to enact their rights as Indigenous people, and they do not teach non-Indigenous people what it means to work for Indigenous self-determination in this country or anywhere else. Yeah, curriculum accreditation requirements, regardless of the discipline that you're in, whether it's in law or medicine or social work or education or planning or architecture or engineering, none of them have anything like the kinds of accreditation requirements that people need to be able to work for decolonial futures in them. You, you've seen the kinds of stuff. I mean, you know what I've written on the cross-curriculum priorities and the Eitzel standards, right? Like none of this, the entire university sector is complicit in reproducing non-Indigenous people who have no idea what is the content or timbre of Indigenous rights in this country, none of them. Yeah, and we make knowledge, that is our job. Our job is to authorise and reproduce knowledge and we do none of it about Indigenous rights with the exception of, you know, like what, four, five, six people, you know, in an entire university? Because it costs money. Giving us our fucking land back costs someone money and until they are willing to put the money in the bank and understand who that bank account holder should be, you know, the, the kind of future that we're after is one in which Indigenous people continue to be tokenised, our, our rights dismissed, that our kids are going to continue being taken away. Because there is no structure, there is no money, there is no impetus for our own cultural continuity. And you can put whatever label you want on it. You can call it the social determinants of health, you can call it self-determination, you can call it cultural continuity. It doesn't matter what you call it. If we are unable to transmit knowledge of our rights and knowledge of our culture and languages from one generation to the next, then you have failed and we have failed. And that is something that we are all here trying to prevent from happening. Um, I want to apologise for swearing, um, but... Um, Effectively, what we represent here is that we are the first generation never to be have, never to have been taken mm. from our families. Fair. Fair. Yeah. Fair. Fair. We are the first generation. I actually think that's quite shocking um, in a nation that calls itself. Um, you know, 21st century modern, that um, we are that first generation. So, you know, and, and because I am an educator, I am really passionate about the possibilities. But um, taking our children takes our future. And that's why I get upset. I'm also sorry for swearing as well, aren't you? Got me, you got me riled up. Oh. Yeah, I've got, I've got something to add too. Um, and I'm not going to swear, I promise. Um, I, I, I want to just get a little bit pragmatic, a, a little bit more, um, uh, you know, they're really, really important points, but the, the pessimist in me doesn't think that's going to happen tomorrow. So, so if, we, if we look at... You know, contributing factors that lead to children growing up, becoming parents, and struggling, and um, ending up where where you were talking about before, cuz, and um, ending up with you know having kids taking off of them. A huge part of that is about self worth, and and I self worth. Sorry, and and, and I wonder, <coughs> and I've got no evidence of this, but I'm old now. Like I've, I've well, I'm older. Um, my colleagues who are doing well are strong culturally. And I wonder whether that plays a part in, because uh, identity is extraordinarily important to us, I wonder whether that plays a part in um, 
choices that we make growing up. If you know where you fit, you know where your heart is, where your line is, where you, where you, where you fit in the community, um, you can focus on other things. Especially if you're fair, or if you look Italian like I do. Um, you, yeah. um, you, you know where you fit in. It doesn't really matter whether you're challenged. You know where you fit in. You go home, your mum, your aunties, your, your, your uncles, your cousins all love you up and they tell you all, all the stuff that you need to know. If you, are, if you don't have that cultural affirmation, if you don't have that cultural strength, what is society portraying that Aboriginality is? And we all know, we see the media, it's not, it's not a pretty picture. So, so what can Monash University do to it? I, I want you and everybody here in your classroom, online, it doesn't, it doesn't matter where, to, to critically analyse what, how are you portraying Aboriginal Australia to your students, to your families, to everybody else. Because if you're always talking about football, clearly not all of us are good at sport, if you're always talking about art, which I'm also not good at, and they're the role models that you're putting forward, mm. and when you're not putting forward the stereotypical great footballer, great artist, you're putting forward um, uh, the Kuri Kid who mucks up, you're putting forward stories about um, uh, you know, how wonderful the Kuri kids are that, that just got out of Parkville because they've turned their lives around. If all our kids are hearing and our families are hearing is that element, we all know the impact of, of, of student self-efficacy. This is, this is societal self-efficacy. It, 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 that, that's what you can do. Critically analyse how you're portraying in your personal life and in your professional life, Aboriginal Australia, and, and genuinely ask yourself, is this, can I do better? Did you have anything to add, Eddie? You can do that tomorrow, by the way. You can do that tonight on the way home. Mm -hmm. I think... Um, we might have been the first, but I've just come off a Royal Commission where um, there's plenty of stolen kids, right, in the Northern Territory and, and elsewhere in the country. So things are getting worse. And I think basically um, it comes basically right down to respect and, and that, that's none for Aboriginal people in this country. And... Um, and if we did, you know, we at the previous election we all worried about our franking credits, and, and and we all made a real ridiculous decision at the ballot box, and we voted for um, for a government now that's really um, caused huge dramas in this country for all of us, and um, and now we're hoping that we can go back to maybe where there is no more stolen kids. Um, but that comes back on on the ninety seven percent of the population mm. and and I generally think you know Australians are a fairly a fairly good, but we've got to stop watching the six o'clock shows and um, getting our facts from there right that's that's the reality of it all I think and um and and it comes back to respect and and I, and if you don't know what Indigenous people go through, you just don't have the understanding and the respect that what it takes to to go and get a education in a system that's basically against you. Um, to sit in there and hear them talk about your people and um, and go back the next day and hear it again and 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 after year after year and then go and work in that environment and so. It, it's, it's not easy, right? And the reality is, then you go and get racially profiled on your way home and um, pulled over, and um, and go to the shop and you get followed around the shop. And and so these are all realities, not only for Indigenous people but for people of colour in this country. And and I think I just don't think we're really understanding that. And um, and, and look, I, I've been a lawyer, I've been a discrimination commissioner, and I've been racially profiled just the other day. And, by police, and I just we're we're a long way of changing that. If 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 people in here can't basically stand up for what's generally right, and I think we lost a lot of um, respect, humility, humanity, and basic empathy for one another. And I think um, Indigenous people have always shown that um, we're not going to go anywhere because we're from here, and um, we'll we'll continue to um, you know turn up. And share and 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 want to 
share our country and, and show you our country. But uh, somewhere along the line, the respect needs to come back and, um, and, and our kids are getting equipped to be better at it and, and hopefully that helps. But we're also losing um, cultural respect for our own mob and our elders. And, and so those are some of the things we need to reinforce f from our side of the fence for our, our people. But we can't do it on our own, and, and we've been doing it on our own for a long time. And I think, um, you know, Australians generally are good people, but um, that they, we can go back to the statistics or the um, indicators or, or whatever we want to talk about. But um, the reality is, um, we got to look over the fence and stop worrying about just us. Um, it's a big, big country, and and. And we, it's only one country we got, and and the way we're going in regards to climate change and everything, you know, you got a lot to learn there from blackfellas. So I, I just think um, we're in this together, and, and the reality is, um, Indigenous people are tired of um, doing all the teaching, and, um, sh and and trying to be respectful. So that's all I, I really want to say about it. I well, we've got one minute to go. Um, I, I was going to say, Aunt, did you have anything to wrap up on? Um, you can use my mic if you want. Thanks. Sorry, darling. Sorry. Oh, oh there we go. go. Here we go. Um, well, I, I think um, tonight's been really interesting. Um, thank you for those people who are online for joining tonight. Thank you for those who um, travelled to Frankston. Um, Frankston? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah, Bunwaran country. That's easier to remember. Coming down and listening to this conversation, um, it's always very interesting to have a panel and watch of Indigenous people and watch how um, the rhythm of that conversation um, flows and and rises in terms of the commonality often that we have um, around the issues. Um, and this evening, I think what we've been saying are a number of things. Decolonisation is complex. Um, but decolonisation isn't going to work unless there's some deep thinking about that complex complexity. Decolonisation cannot just be the work of Indigenous people alone and it actually requires sincere, genuine, authentic commitment from those who um, say that they would be our allies in this process of decolonisation. Um, and decolonisation gives us the language at the moment within white frames of making transformation. But watch this space because our language is coming down the pipeline real fast yeah. and we'll be able to teach you different frames for, for different ways of thinking so that we can be together in this country. Thank you. Okay. Look, um, I'm not sure if everyone had uh, read the title, but it's a Dean's Lecture Series, uh, one, of the, one of many, I'm assuming. But uh, I'd like to say thanks to Viv for handing me the reins to be the interim dean for tonight, just one night. But uh, it's, it's not every day you get to, <laughs> to stand up here and you know, listen to an esteemed panel of um, Aboriginal people, the real leaders in their field and making an amazing contribution and, and a lot of change. So I feel really proud that Monash was able to put on an event like this. And uh, I'd just like to say thank you to our panellists. I mean, I'm sure everyone got a hell of a lot out of tonight. So could everyone please give them a huge round of applause? I think there was a lot of really, uh, really strong themes that came through and uh, certainly a lot of it um, really resonated with me. 
Uh, so again, thank you all for coming. If you signed in online or if you attended in person, it means a lot to us all. And hopefully this is the, the start of, you know, a lot of really positive change in the Faculty of Education and, you know, um, you know, some Indigenous leadership and, you know, hopefully we're here in a year's time we're talking about how we've really uh, made some strong progress incorporating Indigenous perspectives and in content and decolonising the structures and the curriculum.